Well, um, I guess we're there at the top of the hour. So thanks one more time here at the last session of the day to all of our sponsors as listed on the slides as always. Um, I won't wrap up at the end. So I'll just say there is an online social hour tonight for anybody that has not heard about that. Gina has posted that information over on the reception um, room here. So take it away one more time, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can. So there's an interesting question. If I share the entire screen, does it follow me as I change desktops? Mm -hmm. Well, you can... that is interesting. Oh, Rogan says no. Oh, OK. All right, I may have to do some juggling then. <laughs> OK. All right, let's start with this. OK, so I'll, I'll mostly not be looking at the screen if there's any I'll, I'll try to check in regularly but if there's I'll monitor chat for you okay thank you mm -hmm. so one of my um hi everybody <laughs> uh it's been a while since we've seen each other uh, so it's good to be here virtually hope to see you all again soon um one of my uh favorite things about this conference is seeing what people are doing uh, with Evergreen or uh, projects related to Evergreen, because um, it always gives me a lot of uh, ideas and uh, think, things to think about uh, as the year moves on. Um, so a project that uh, I've been working on at King County for a little while <clears throat> has kind of reached uh, a level at this point where I, I feel like I can kind of do a report on it, talk about uh, the history of the project, what it is, how it's going, um, and then just a little bit of technical pieces here and there, but mostly pretty high level. So um, the project I'm referring to is uh, a um, migration to uh, a product called Elasticsearch. And uh, specifically, this is a product that sits sort of down next to our database, and it manages indexing bibliographic records and other visibility data. Um, and we use that as the basis for our catalog searching. Um, so in Evergreen, by default, it's going to do searches directly in the Postgres database. Um, and so with this project was to take just a small part of that transaction that happens between the client and the server and move some of it over to an external indexing engine. The um, outset of this project really was I had one one goal in mind, uh, and that was to speed up the catalog for staff. The um, uh, At King County, the patient catalog uh, is a third-party catalog that's outside of Evergreen at this point. Uh, so that was not part of my uh, consideration when I went down this road. We really just had to do with the uh, search speed for the staff. And um, But as I kind of went along with it, um, I found along the way that there were lots of other benefits to the to this approach. So it's part of why I want to talk about it because there's just other cool bits and pieces that go along with it. Some notable points along the way. The discussion of Elasticsearch or you know external indexing engines uh, is not new. It's been around pretty close to the beginning of Evergreen. Um, it wasn't there on day one of Evergreen, at least not in, in the form that was usable to us at the time. Uh, but around those same times, around the early days of the um, Code for Lib conference, um, people started talking about some of these other products that could do uh, uh, te full text indexing and make it really fast and have all these different uh, features and everything. So one of the early ones was Solar, S-O-L-R. Uh, and that's still used today. Um, I'm about 99% sure in uh, some other uh, discovery layer uh, interfaces that are out there now, like uh, Viewfind and Blacklight. And I'm sure there's other ones. And correct me if I'm wrong about the use of solar, but I think that's the way it works. Some of them may support different indexing engines. I'm not totally sure, but I just remember solar being a big one for a while. Um, and I've experimented with it. Um, and it's similar to what I'm talking about today, which is kind of why I mentioned it. And then uh, King County, where I work, um, back before I started working there, uh, they adopted Evergreen 
Uh, and then not long after adopting it, they migrated their patron catalog to a third party uh, setup. And, um, you know, I wasn't there in the room, um, but I, I have it on good authority that at, at least a big factor in the decision to use a separate patron catalog had to do with the speed of the catalog. Uh, there were other, you know, parts of that decision as well, but just catalog speed was always kind of um, something that they struggled with on the early, uh, early days and then eventually moved the, um, the uh, patron catalog to a third party. Um, and there's some debate about this next point here. Uh, uh, I, I had a very firm memory of Jeff Godin doing a presentation on Elasticsearch years ago at the Evergreen Conference. And I asked him the other day if he had slides, and I think his response was something like, did I present on that or did we just talk about it? It's entirely possible there was no presentation. We may have just talked about it at the Hackfest, perhaps, uh, or after the Hackfest. Uh, but suffice to say, he he did a demo at some point and kind of walked through some code that he had posted on uh, on GitHub. And that was one of the early sparks for me to explore Elasticsearch as a as a tool. And uh, I borrowed, uh, initially looked at a lot of his code. I cloned his repository and I started exploring how he had built some of the code that he had built. And then um, I started feeling pretty good about it. I, 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 I seemed like it was a great, uh, a very user-friendly user tool to use. So then I started building it more. Um, so I think, I think the code that he had originally written was in Python. So then I started moving over to Perl and trying to build it into Evergreen more directly so that it wouldn't be quite such an external process. And then I'm, so I'm working on my kind of proof of concept for that, trying to make, see if I can have something that I can demo off to our staff. Uh, and then Blake opens a Launchpad ticket, which I'll go ahead and open, that is more or less having to do with, can we bring in alternative search engines for certain types of searches? And the example that Blake provides in the description here is maybe we want to do keyword searches with something like Elasticsearch, because the, the, the idea of using it has come up in different conversations in HackFest. It's not, it certainly didn't come just from me or just from Joe. Um, and um, so, the, so the, the idea of this bug was maybe we can use it as a certain part of a plugin to, to Evergreen. Uh, and this has been the place where I have posted my code since this branch was open. Now, my code does not do what Blake describes here. Um, it's not terribly different and it's in the same kind of wheelhouse, but it's not identical to what Blake describes. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. But uh, there is, uh, working branches and a couple of different rebased versions on here if anyone's interested in the code. Um, so then we're, you know, we're working on a browser client and then uh, the Angular staff catalog, that starts trucking along and that created a, a, a nice opportunity to um, have this new staff catalog interface and hey, I have this other thing I'm working on that speeds up search. Maybe I could get those two together and then you know make it, they'll have a nice single family there. So that's kind of how I organized it um, on our side as King County was migrating to the browser client. The um, I planned it out so that they would go to the Angular staff catalog, and that when they and when they did, it would be sitting on top of Elasticsearch. So that we kind of skipped some steps in there. We basically went from Zool client to browser client with Angular staff catalog sitting on top of Elasticsearch, uh, which meant that we migrated later than probably everyone else. But we were able to skip a few steps along the way, and now we're kind of in a good spot. Um, so early, or sorry, in, in 2020, um, we did a deployment of the new catalog with Elasticsearch underneath it. And that was to mainly to staff at our um, centralized processing center. So this is going to be catalog acquisition serials and and a couple of other staff in that kind of group. Uh, and they were our primary testing group uh, for, for making sure that it worked for us, finding bugs, any other features we wanted to add. So big thanks to that whole crew there. They, uh, uh, we had a lot of discussion sessions, a lot of back and forth, a lot of testing, and um, we kind of got it where we thought it was gonna work. And then we opened the doors up to all uh, staff and um, somewhere early, early along or late last year, it was open to all staff. And then early this year, it was uh, it was the only option 
So now all staff are using it. It's been that way for several months. So now we have the whole uh, King County staff and all the branches using the new catalog on Elasticsearch. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but Elasticsearch is pretty neat. It's, um, you know, it's not unique, as I said, it's similar to Solar and other products, but it's really a lot of fun to use because you can just put whatever data you want in there. And it does a really good job of chopping it up and making it searchable with a simple web API. And um, as a part of this, they've added tons of features, a lot of features that I'll probably never get to. Um, some features that I'm surprised about, uh, some features that I thought, well, I don't know how we're going to implement that. You know, Evergreen can do that, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to do that. And then I'll go look at the documentation and it's it's already implemented. And, you know, all I have to do is add a user interface piece to take advantage of it. But it's pretty popular and it's um, used across different industries. It's the kind of thing that you'll see a lot in, you know, at sort of on the corporate side, the library side and everything you can think of in between. Uh, personally, I felt very comfortable using it. I like the API. Uh, the documentation is excellent. They provide excellent examples. Um, you can, you know, the examples, you can just sort of copy and paste sometimes and just drop those into a command line and run their examples, which is really handy. Um, there's great debugging tools, great tools to show you how the text is analyzed or chopped up or broken up or how the searching might work. The um, uh, clustering and replication came uh, was built into it from the beginning, I'm pretty sure. And that's uh, and that was really a matter of, you know, two or three config file changes. And that all worked quite smoothly and quite easily. And uh, it is, of course, open source. And there are vendors out there if you uh, choose to have a vendor provide support for it. The Another part of this discussion isn't just how it's implemented with Elasticsearch, but it's the broader topic of indexing bib data and copy data so to some extent outside of Evergreen versus inside of Evergreen. So there are pluses and minuses, of course. Um, and this, mostly I'm talking about the pluses because that's the fun stuff. Um, but anything that sits externally has to be managed externally. And I'll get a little bit more into that as well. But some of the pluses to doing this are when you have something that is designed from day one to be a full text search engine, it's going to be fast for searching. That's a big part of it, of course. Uh, but it also is, uh, it, certainly in the case of Elasticsearch, and I suspect in other examples as well, very fast at, at indexing. Um, the when when we want to re re ingest our full bib data set before Elasticsearch, I had a script that would run every night for five nights. And it would run all night and then stop in the morning and then we wouldn't run it in the day. And that was kind of a bit of a process. Uh, but now with Elasticsearch, which admittedly is doing way less than a full bib ingest does, it's just focusing on these certain search aspects. So um, that is certainly part of it. But um, if I run my indexing script and I can run, I have it set up to where I can run several at a time, I can do the full data set in a little bit under two hours. So if you're adding fields, changing different search queries, changing analysis or normalization or anything like that, you can have a full brand new data set in less than two hours. You can start testing. Um, and then along those lines, uh, that bottom data set, uh, parallel interchangeable data sets. So one of the benefits of having an external indexing operation is that you can take your entire data set, index it into this thing that sits off to the side, and then while that's running and being used in production, you can take your entire data set from Evergreen and then index it again and then have a copy of it just next to it. And you can test that and try your new search queries to make sure your modifications work. And then when you're ready to move the new one, you just essentially flip a switch. I can show you what that looks like too. It's just a single uh, command line tool to run. And uh, it'll just point from one database to the next. So you don't have to have that period where the the data set is partially re-ingesting and things are kind of in limbo. Another obvious benefit is that it takes heavy load off the primary database or the databases in general. The uh, search queries are pretty CPU intensive sometimes. So getting those off the primary database can potentially mean not having to require as much uh, database resources. 
kind of a small one, but you know, it comes up sometimes. Um, if you do really big searches in Evergreen now, um, and I'm pretty sure this is still the case, but if you do really, really big searches where it's more than you know thousands and thousands of tens of thousands or however many results, uh, you'll get an estimate. Um, and then with the uh, with the full text search externally, it's going to give you the exact count of documents that match. Now, not the big of a deal if you're talking thousands and thousands, but it's you know it's just a, a piece of it. So I thought I'd mention it. Uh, and then, of course, again, if we're talking about something that was built from the ground up to solve this particular type of problem, then it's going to have a lot of function uh, baked in that um, that you know you don't have to code for necessarily, apart from sometimes just in user interface changes. Um, and I'm just going to pause for a second, look back, make sure there's going on. Okay, looks like we're good there. Um, unless I missed something, but in, in that case, feel free to interrupt me. So what is implemented in the code that I'm talking about? Um, and the uh, so what I've implemented is an API for kind of what you think of as the main catalog search page, keyword title, et cetera, and all the filters. Um, some of the numeric searches, some of the numeric searches aren't included because they're things like barcode searches, which you don't need a full text for that. You're just doing an identifier lookup. The um, mark search is entirely moved over to this new structure. And then it also supports um, query string, which is something that Evergreen already supports. And this, the syntax is similar, uh, but some of the things you do are a little bit different. So I, th I thought that it was worth mentioning there. So I'm gonna do just a couple of, just show a couple of examples here. Um, okay, that's the launch pad ticket. So this is our testing cluster, uh, King County. And uh, so we have our staff catalog. And like I said, the um, speed is just sort of assumed. There's not really going to be any weight for most general queries, uh, which is nice, obviously. Um, uh, but there's pretty much, there's not a lot you can throw at it that isn't going to be near instantaneous as far as the uh, results go. And some of these queries would take over a minute uh, in in our system if they were running on the, uh, you know, the traditional catalog. Um, so this covers all of the keyword and variations there. Covers all of these. More on these in a second. Covers all the filters, publication year, the sorting, and all that stuff. So... I didn't, there's no, there's no UI changes here, except for a couple things here that I'll get to in a sec. Uh, it just sort of all happens um, on the back end. And um, the way I have the code running right now is you can, you can see it'll, it logs the queries off to the side. So you can get a sense of what the query, um, query language looks like from here. So that's that section. So a couple of the numeric, a couple of the um, numeric searches are done here, and then the mark search as well. And mark search is traditionally kind of slow too. So this, you know, solves that. Um, and by the way, if if I I love it when people try to test this stuff. So if there's anything you want me to try to look for. <laughs> Just tell me and I'll I'll try it. Um, it just to see if we can find something that's uh, that I don't have properly indexed or it seems like it's slow or anything like that. Um, I I do take requests. Um, <laughs> okay, you've got a request from Blake for dog. <laughs> Andrea wants you to to uh, search it because as Boyer Jason Boyer says, everyone loves it. <laughs> okay, so this is just keyword it. Yeah, I imagine. So that's going to be pretty broad. Uh, I'll try and title it. It, 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 it. Um, nice. So, um, yeah. <laughs> You're getting a lot of nice responses there. Jason Stephenson wants to see the, the, or the, the, depending on how you pronounce that. Your double T-H-E's. Let's see. I wonder if we have any uh, the the. Yeah. Let me try an author search. <laughs> I 
Yeah, I don't know if we have any. I'll have to look at that. That's kind of interesting. Um, let me try a slightly more direct search. So. <laughs> the United it's States be controller of the currency. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what's going on there. You've opened it uh, up. You're going to keep getting requests, I think, for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah. So let me try something. All right. Hold on. Let's just try something. That's going to be any better. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I want to look at that, though. That's that's a good <laughs> query. Um, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what was I saying? Okay. Uh, all right. So, so query string. The, um, the way I have it set up is if you type something in the keyword in that in the keyword search bar that has a colon in it, which is generally how you define uh, the different types of query string searches, then it's sort of bumps it up as a query string and, and, and sends it off to uh, Elasticsearch like that. So some examples here is the first one is um, give me everything. So that's our whole data set. Our 1.13, et cetera, million bib records. So from there, of course, you can you know filter it and do whatever else you want. Um, let's see, if something like pub day, this is, this is something you can do in every now. Um, some of the other pub date things do support things like ranges. So give me everything that was published between 2001 and 2010. Um, I, I'm also indexing the bib record create date and edit date, which may be um, useful to some uh, catalogers. Very nice. So you can do ranges of create date. And since the create date is is the index itself is stored as a date field, not just a free text field. Um, it it will it understands things like months, years, and then you can further hone that down to a more specific date time. So the um, the date fields are dates. A lot of the text fields are just free text. Um, there's a couple of different ways to enter the data, and it'll index it and normalize it for you to um, handle sort of the common cases. Um, and then you can also do kind of inline greater than or equal, stuff like that. It's pretty fun. Um, and then, of course, nested Boolean queries. Um, so I want keyword dogs and pub date is 21 or 22, or give me stuff about cats that wasn't published in 22. And that can, I mean, you can take these as far down as you want. Uh, they can be as nested as you want them to be. Okay. It has uh, analysis and normalization, kind of like what we have now in Evergreen. Um, it's you know implemented to work with Elasticsearch, of course, so it's different. But the um, the ideas are the same. You can you can remove uh, periods. You can replace them with spaces. You can remove punctuation. Um, replace them with spaces or replace or not with spaces. And um, so those kind of things are implemented as well. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have the apostrophe for the S, it's still going to find it. Um, and then, of course, my favorite, just the REM, which we can search for in all manner of ways. The results are going to be a little bit different. There are records in here that have the same letters in them in other contexts, but you're going to get. REM in the result set, no matter how you enter the value. The closer you are to what's in the actual record, the higher it's going to bubble up to the top, but you'll still get the uh, results. So one of the things that to me is so fun about this is um, it has a lot of features built in that I mentioned before that you can kind of poke around their documentation and um, and then kind of work from there. So um, one of the things I did since I had ported the um, Mark search over to Elastic as well, I went ahead and added this dropdown as a way to further refine the search. Since um, this was already built into the keyword searching, uh, adding it here at this point after moving it to Elastic Search was was a simple thing of putting this putting this drop down in the form and collecting the value and then passing it off to the search. 
So this is a new feature that was added uh, that I was able to add as a result of this. And not only that, but I added some different um, query types, for lack of a better word. So uh, uh, Evergreen by default has the contains and does not and phrase and I think contains exactly and maybe starts with, I forget exactly. Um, but uh, the way these work now is the first three here are text searches. And by that, I mean things like it knows, it understands plurals and singular, it does stemming and all the normal text type stuff. And then the last, the last couple of ones here are what uh, Elastic would call term searches, which are literal character searches. So um, these are extremely useful for things like, um, uh, let's see, queries that are just punctuation, for example. So the, the, the data that's searching with here is not is undergoing no normalization or analysis whatsoever. It's just, is this character there? Is this character there? Is this character there? And that's really powerful. Uh, that's something that, was, that the catalogers really found useful as well. Um, and then, the um, last one here. Before you go on, Bill, you've got a question. Yep. Are, are popularity badges integrated? Uh, I'll get to that a little bit, but uh, no, they're not. Okay. Uh, but it's doable. Uh, I, I went. I wanted to. Well, I'll talk about it in a second. <laughs> come right back to that in a minute. Um, and then a, we had a query come in from the catalogers that had to do with. They were trying to run a report to find bib records that had a certain, or didn't have certain values in the 008, but they had uh, graphic novels, I think, in a, like a 650 field or 605 or something like that. Uh, they were trying to find records that weren't cataloged correctly, and they were trying to build a report to do it. And and so they were, we were talking about how would we do that, you know, was, and, and honestly, I didn't know how to do it. Um, but uh, it occurred to me that, well, maybe we don't need to run a report, maybe we can, you know, make it so you can just find it in the catalog. So I added this right here, this regular expression match. So this supports, you know, regular expression searching. And um, so the, the final query that they were looking for in the example that was provided, oh, wrong server, that's okay, it should work. It should route me over. The, uh, right, so the this is the uh, regular expression here. So bib records with 605A that contain graphic novels and an 008 where field position 24, 25, and 26 do not contain the number six. Um, so this is their list of records that they would then add to a basket and then go off and batch update to fix the, uh, the 008. But um, this, uh, so this regular expression stuff is new and, and um, I didn't have to do anything. Um, you probably can't see it, it's very small, but there's a query type here. This is called regex p, and then you pass in the field names and the values you want to provide. Uh, but that didn't, that required zero coding on the back end for my part. I just had to add this thing to the dropdown, and then I had to use the. Um, I'm using a JavaScript, a JavaScript library to build the Elastic queries, and there it has a class or a uh, an object type called regex p. So I just say give me one of those, and I gave it some text, and then I got this out of it. Oh, here we go. So um, the, if I'm missing something from this list, let me know. But if these are the ones that I recall that are not yet implemented in the code that I have. Now, um, these have not been requested by our staff, which is you know the main reason I have not implemented them. That's not to say they wouldn't like to have them. It just hasn't been a high priority. Um, but I have done some research on these. And um, I can say with a high level of confidence, all of these can be implemented. Um, I did. I have started on a did you did you mean implementation, and um, so I was able to use something that Elasticsearch calls phrase suggestors. They have term suggestors and phrase suggestors, and um, so this would be something like the, the provide a nice example here. Uh, wait, I think the actual example is at the top of the page. Uh, maybe it's not, but um, it, it's it's kind of what you expect, where you search for. Ready Player One, and you misspell the word "player." It's going to suggest Ready Player One as a as a phrase, and not just like you misspelled one word. Um, search results highlighting. This is also implemented, so you can 
you can get um, all fancy and you can tell it how you want to encode the highlighting, what the HTML tags are going to be if you want to encode classes and things like that in there. So it'll it will it'll break the data down and give you all kinds of uh you know it'll tell you what you search for and then wrap it in, in HTML tags. The same thing that we're doing in Evergreen now. Um, auto suggest there is a completion suggester module in here that would work similar to what we normally call auto suggest in Evergreen. Uh, these three right here. They wouldn't require any additional features on the Elasticsearch side since we already we already manage and compile this data in Evergreen. The popularity badges, the uh, location groups, or or unit lasso definitions uh, that wouldn't require anything special on the Elasticsearch side. It would just be a question of adding that field to the stuff we index in the data set, and then adding that filter to the catalog or a sorter or, or whatever it is. However, we're doing to uh, to take advantage of that data. Um, these would all be pretty pretty simple, I believe. Uh, but if there's any others I've forgotten, let me know, and I'll add it to the list. Because I, I do I do like the idea of having it be feature complete with Evergreen. Okay. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay, good, plenty of time. I'm, I don't have too much left anyway. So um, one of the concerns that anyone has when I'm talking about something like this is, you know, aren't we talking about adding a whole additional thing to Evergreen, which is already a pretty complicated uh, collection of stuff. Um, so is this going to be, you know, is it a lot to set up? Is it a lot to maintain? Uh, what's that? What's that situation like? The um, installation itself is is simple. There's uh, Elasticsearch has Debian or yeah, Debian based uh, packages and Fedora and other things like that. Um, that are ready to go for a variety of different release versions that they maintain. And then they, when they install, they just set up a systemd on Ubuntu and it's pretty much, you just start it and it's good to go. And then there is a Perl module that I used to implement the API integration with Evergreen. The, um, after a few months of use, I got a help desk ticket from one of our catalogers saying that they were trying to find a certain record, couldn't find it using the uh, new catalog. And one of the features that we have in Evergreen now, but and also in Elasticsearch, is um, this idea of ASCII folding, where if you take something that uses characters beyond the basic ASCII character set, so accents and, and things like that, um, you know, if it looks like a letter, so if it's an N with an accent over it, and you just want to type N, then there are mapping tools that will be able to search for that on the back end that says they just typed in, but we know we want to match it to in with the uh, accent. So that's uh, also uh, an, a baked in tool that Elasticsearch has. Uh, but then there are some character sets that were beyond what uh, Elasticsearch could do by default. So I was able to find a plugin uh, that comes with it, uh, the uh, ICU plugin, and it added support for a whole wide a range of additional character sets. And I have a, a example of that toward the end that I will show as well. And then as far as building the indexes, uh, part of the code that I wrote is just a, a Perl script. And you can just create indexes, populate them, and activate them. That activation stage is what I was talking about before, where you could you could go ahead and create multiple indexes, and then you can go ahead and populate multiple indexes. But only one can be active at a time, so this activate flag will flip it to the one that you want to activate, the one that you've got ready to go. Uh, our production setup, nothing too, nothing too fancy. We run two VMs. Each has enough space to store a, a live index and a secondary index. So it's, you always want to have enough space to store that secondary one. It's not. You don't have to, but um, it's a good way to, you know, like I said before, kind of set up a staged version of a new set of indexes that you could test first and then move into production. The uh, replication is baked in. So we have one node that handles the writes, and then it sends off the writes to the replica node. If um, either node goes down, the catalog will continue to function. If it's the right node that goes down, then the catalog will go into read-only mode. 
Um, and if it's the read node that goes down, then or the replica node, then it'll continue in write and read mode. And um, if it goes into write only mode or read only mode, then uh, the catalog will keep working. It'll just slowly get out of date, and you'll have to you would have to catch back up on the indexing via the regularly running indexing script. Um, and then just, I feel like I need to mention it. The, um, when you install Elasticsearch by default, it's only listening on localhost. In the case of the cluster, the way I have it set up, it's listening on a subnet. That's just, you know, you can only get to it via that subnet. But then additionally, I applied uh, firewall rules to limit access to, to the, uh, to the Elasticsearch port, because if you have direct access to the port, you can just delete the whole index. It's just a simple, a simple curl command. So, gotta you really want to lock that down. And then what I've done is, um, so one of the down, well, not downfalls, one of the complications with running an external indexing setup is that you do have to keep it updated. Um, some, 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 there has to be some way in place for every time the bib record gets edited or some visibility factor on the bib record, a copy status gets changed, et cetera, somehow that information needs to be brought over into the Elasticsearch setup so that it knows not to display that record or return that record in search results when you're applying certain filters. So um, I run two scripts to do that. I have one that runs every minute and it re-indexes uh, every record whose visibility might have changed in the last minute. Um, so that's going to be obviously an edit on the record itself, an edit on any of its copies or any of its call numbers. And um, so that runs, and that, that initial query is pretty quick. And then on, at a busy time during the day, it might be indexing two or 300 records a minute. And then I run a second script. Um, so first we started off with the one. And then at some point along the way, we were getting uh, requests or, you know, the catalogers were saying we, they couldn't find a record. Um, so we come to find out what they were doing is they were indexing bib records or creating new bib records. Uh, so they would go into OCLC connection, pull in the record, add our local edits, import the record through the Markstream importer, and then immediately open the catalog and search for it by ISBN. And because the indexer script was running every minute, it wasn't showing up. So uh, now we have a second script that runs every two seconds, and it um, it only looks at newly created records. So um, if it was running that often, and it was looking at everything that changed in the last two seconds it might get behind, I'm not sure. So I told it just to look at new records. So now when they're indexing new records from OCLC, they just add it. And then by the time they've got the catalog open and copy paste of the USD ISBN, uh, the records in the catalog and searchable. Um, and of course there's, we have Zabbix uh, alert. Uh, alerting and maintenance type stuff set up. So the, the VMs themselves are, of course, monitored. The indexer scripts are monitored to make sure the lock files don't stick around. Um, make sure we're not running out of disk space and RAM and all that fun stuff. Now, I want to, to demo a couple of these uh, things that you can do. But from what I've been told, you can't see my command line anymore. So I'm going to change how I'm sharing real quick so that it focuses on um, my, let me just check that out. Okay, yep, good. So I'll demo these and then I won't have to change back. Um, I'm gonna have it look at my uh, terminal real quick. Tell if it's looking, which one it's looking at. Oh, that's the one. Okay. Okay, there we go. And before you get started, Chris Sharp had a question. Would there be a way to leverage, I might say this incorrectly, please excuse me. Would there be a way to leverage Perl PL trigger to do the updates? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, you could do database triggers to do the updates. Um, I was, I was a little worried about taking that approach. I don't, I'm not exactly sure why I'm sure it would work fine for re, for, for reasons that are only somewhere in the back of my head from a couple of years ago, I decided that I was less worried about something going wrong when using an external script than putting the updates directly in there. Um, one obvious thing is that then the updates would might take longer. 
And the other th complication with that is the visibility of record being based on record call number copy and potentially other data. It could mean having triggers in lots of different places or having a trigger that has to run every time a copy changes. So, I, you know, it, it seemed I was a little worried about it, but I, you can certainly do it. Yeah, great. And, um, and okay. Jeff and Chris are just having a conversation there about other ways to make it happen. The okay, job. great. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Um, so some of the stuff you can do, um, I'm logged into the Elasticsearch instance on our testing cluster. Um, so that kind of went quickly, sorry. So there's, um, uh, so it's running locally here and I can just run it on localhost and do curl commands. I know, let me make that a little bit bigger. So um, this command I ran right now is basically just give me document and then I put, in, put the ID in at the end of the URL and it gives me the bit record as it is indexed in Elasticsearch. Um, there's the big keyword blob. Um, and then here it's moving down into the data that it collects for copy visibility filtering. Um, and I know it on tons and tons of times, so I'm not gonna go into loads of details about this, but uh, I just wanted to kind of show it off. Uh, ISBNs, and then you can see here's the mark data that's just being uh, indexed as raw data there. Um, more fields, more fields, yeah. So that's this is really handy if you're working on indexes or catalogers are pulling in new records and they want to understand why something is or isn't working. Then you can pull up the index record as it is and see exactly what data it should be querying on and maybe why it's not working. Um, and then, of course, you can do just searches on the command line. So there's there's your dog search. Like, um, and then it pulls in all the records that match the keyword dogs. And um, just a note about the API. The API doesn't return all this stuff when you're doing a search. Uh, it just returns the document ID, the score for sorting. Um, and then if and then facets, which is a separate part, and you know, eventually when I do the did you mean type stuff, that'll be another little piece that's added on. But, but most of this stuff does not come back to the catalog. The catalog is using the native evergreen bib display fields and all the other native evergreen data for display. It's just that initial data set. Um, and there's lots of celebration do. that you can now search dog quickly. <laughs> Yay. Cats works too. <laughs> uh, just and then this is useful when you're indexing because you can just get a count of records in the data set. Um, you can query things like um, uh, health of the structure of the uh, cluster of the indexes. This is a cluster health command. We have a Zabbix, uh tool that parses this and reads it every couple of seconds couple of seconds and looks at these values and of specific note is the status. Um, and the uh, Elasticsearch won't give you a green status if you only have one node running, which is why this one's yellow. Uh, and in production, we have the two nodes running. So it, it's a green status. So if, if Zabbix ever sees that's not being green in production, then we get our emails and everything about that. But it's all nice and, and uh, you know, machine parsable. Um, and then Something else that's really, really helpful for when you're designing analysis and index and normalizers and all of that kind of stuff is you can ask it how it thinks something is going to look once it's gone through a certain type of analysis. So the um, the um, example I gave earlier about a cataloger saying they couldn't find a record um, and it's a record and here's the, the title of it right here and you see it has a lot a lot of uh, accents and, uh, you know, sort of non-ASCII characters. Um, and they, the title logger typed in E-N space I-R-U-L. Um, now, of course, that's not really an N. It's not really an L. Uh, you know, as far as the computer's concerned, it's an entirely different value. Um, but one of the ways that we can process this data, as I said before, is to do the ASCII folding uh, to where it translates those into something someone might type. So that you can search on either the accented form or the unaccented form. And uh, if you want to make sure it's working, then you can do these curl commands to run through the analyzer. And um, oops, that's not formatted right. 
Oh, we got the dollar in there. Uh, and it will return how it sees the data being analyzed. So the first taken, the first token going through this um, folding analysis is uh, the EN and then the IRUL and the VANIL. So you can see it's all sort of anglicized or ASC, ASCIized. So um, if you search for those values, then like I said, you can find this particular record, which was hard to find early on uh, just by typing in the, uh, the ASCII letters. And that is the end of my list. I wasn't sure how far to go into the technical stuff here. Um, I, I guess the point really I'm just making is that the, the, the tools that come with it are very handy. And you know, it's like anything, it can be a little bit complicated at first. And the query language can be a little bit complicated at first. But as you kind of get used to it, um, you, you, can, you, you start to see what all it does. And there's just a whole kind of world opens up. But um, yeah, so I'll just look to see now if there's any other questions or anything like that. I'm just kind of scrolling back yeah. and looking through here. Galen just asked, do you have any thoughts about Elasticsearch licensing changes? Uh, no, I don't. I don't know what they are. What did I miss? I'll wait for Galen. I can, I can, I can look it up. You know, you know, <laughs> look it up. That's fine. And we've got uh, lots of capacity. If anybody wants to open their microphone, you can just ask to use audio and video if you'd rather at this point. I can approve you. Uh, Blake says, I can say that I've installed this code and was surprised that it worked when I typed my first search. There wasn't an error, so I thought I configured something wrong. <laughs> I didn't know it was that easy. Can you see the, the uh, comments now? I can't can see keep... the comments now. Yep, okay. I'm looking at them. I'll Thank stop you. reading them to you then. Okay, yeah. Um, to expand on the license uh, issue, uh, this is something I've been... Uh, that's also relevant in uh, the ACOA community context. Um, they added out a direct uh, Apache license, you know, straightforward, uh, but um, now they're a little more complicated um, in ways um, that probably don't particularly affect uh, libraries who just want to use it, uh, but uh, might potentially affect um, somebody who wants uh, to host it on somebody else's uh, behalf. Um, but I haven't to date done any sort of any real deep dig into it. Um, but um, you know, they did manage uh, to potentially create a you know, little bit of a fear and uncertainty and a doubt about uh, their own uh, product, which is fun. Um, but uh, anyway, that's uh, why I uh, asked uh, my question, uh, because it's uh, at the moment no longer, as far as I know, just a straightforward uh, SI uh, blast uh, open source uh, license. Gotcha. Well, thanks for bringing it to my attention. Um, and uh, another question. What about uh, authority records and uh, more particularly uh, NACO uh, normalization? And uh, please uh, feel free to uh, throw uh, virtual tomatoes in uh, my direction for asking <laughs> that uh, question. Uh, no, no, I um, I haven't uh, really dug into authority yet. There's There are a couple of staff at King County that would be thrilled if we ported the browse interface to Elastic. Um, but of course, that's more than just authority. That's a couple of different things brought together. Uh, but I have not even taken a single step in that direction. Well, thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is some normalization that I do uh, in advance of going into the into Elasticsearch, and that's ISBN, ISSN, because uh, we have the ISBN and ISSN modules in Evergreen, so they just run it through that and create the different forms of it and then toss that into the index. And then I do a little bit of cleanup on the pub date sorting. Uh, but then Elastic itself has, of course, all kinds of normalizers that it can apply as well. Um, and uh, 
I use about not very many of them. Uh, so there's probably a lot more I could be doing. Um, but there, there's a lot of stuff out there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm always happy to talk about this anytime. Um, you know where to find me. So thanks for hanging out and attending my session. I appreciate it. And thank you, Bill. It's great. Mm -hmm. Everyone have a good evening.